Good evening. Welcome to today's session by Harvard, Harvard Food Systems Initiative. I'm Smitha Hanif, and I serve as the co-chair for Harvard Food Systems Initiative and the managing director for hospitality and dining at Harvard University. Today, I am pleased to introduce our, our special guest, Dr. Christopher Golden. Dr. Christopher Golden is an assistant professor of planetary health and nutrition at Harvard University's T.H. Chan School of Public Health. As an ecologist and epidemiologist, his research investigates the human health impacts of global environmental change with a focus on food systems. He received his BA from Harvard College and two graduate degrees from UC Berkeley, an MPH in epidemiology with a focus in nutrition and a PhD in environmental science policy and management. Today, he's here to join us to talk about healthy oceans and healthy diets. Dr. Chris Golden, over to you. Thank Perfect. you. Thank you so much, Smitha, for, for having me. And I'm just going to pull up my slides. Hopefully, this should be visible to everyone. And uh, again, thank you so much for having me. Today, I'll be presenting on a body of work that really looks at these interconnections between how we can manage and sustain healthy and sustainable diets by also thinking about ways in which we can conserve the oceans and so that the, really the interrelationships between the two. To provide a planetary health framework, we really should be thinking about this from a perspective of looking at the human health impacts of environmental change. And so whether these ecosystem transformations are looking at global fisheries declines or looking at the conversion of forest to fuel and firewood, or the conversion of forest to agricultural fields, all of these changes will have downstream effects on human health. And so the ways in which we envisage ecosystem transformation, it can actually have an impact on, <clears throat> excuse me, it can have an impact on the ways in which we are actually able to quantify these health impacts. And so what I'm gonna to do today is actually provide a lens into how we actually are able to look at these uh, changing transformations in the ocean. I would always see these headlines of how the world is running out of fish faster than we thought, death of coral reefs, global warming, et cetera. And all of these things will have downstream effects on human health. What I'm gonna to do today is to walk us through how we can actually view changes in ecosystems, how that can lead to declining fish catch, how that then shapes people's alternative foods, how that can lead to dietary change, how that then presents certain populations into nutritional vulnerability, and then where do we go from here? How can we then think about ways in which aquaculture or fisheries management might actually be able to change people's uh, nutrition and create more healthy and more sustainable diets? So to start with declining fish catch, the recent IPCC report has shown that increasing sea temperatures will lead to poleward migration from fisheries from the equator toward the poles with reduced catch all along that equatorial belt. And so we can have an anticipated 30 to 50% decline in fish catch across that entire equatorial area. From an ecological perspective, we see this from a strictly uh, kind of reduction in the abundance and diversity of fish species, but from a public health perspective, we see these same areas highlighted where we, we fear for food insecurity, we worry about ocean governance systems, we worry about climate adaptation. And so it really spells this kind of looming food insecurity crisis where where people are relying on fish for food and to really stabilize and support their food security, we might actually be losing access to these wild resources there, which will then destabilize their food system and have a tremendous impact on human nutrition and human health. And so what sorts of alternative foods will people move into if they are losing access to aquatic foods? In a recent paper that we published, we actually showed that uh, almost by necessity, if you are losing access to aquatic foods, you are moving into something that might be nutritionally inferior. And this is of course um, 
in the context of broad animal source foods being highly nutritious. No, this does not mean that uh, this talk is anti-vegetarian or anti-vegan. I, of course, believe that we need to move into more and more plant-based and plant-forward diets. And yet there are large parts of the world, particularly in the global south, who lack adequate uh, dietary micronutrients and who need greater and greater sources of micronutrient supply in their diet. And so in thinking about how we could best deliver this, this is ordered vertically from most nutritious to least nutritious across a range of different types of nutrients. And so you can see across the board, the top seven different types of animal source foods are all aquatic foods or blue foods. And so small pelagic fish species like herring or sardine or anchovy or bivalves like clams, mussels, oysters, all stuff that we can get here locally in Boston and many, many other parts of the world are highly nutritious and also coincidentally have a relatively small environmental footprint. And so we can think about ways in which we could infuse these into the diet to improve people's nutrition. And so what types of dietary changes could we expect in a rapidly changing world where we have sea temperature rise and ocean acidification and increasing pollution and increasing industrialization of fisheries that will drive reductions in local people's access to seafood? And I propose that there are three different typologies. We would have kind of the unaffected wealthy nations, places like the US or South Korea or New Zealand, where people's where a local collapse of a fishery might change the species that people eat, it might change the price a little bit, but for all intents and purposes, all of the people who were eating fish before will continue to do so, and those who weren't will continue not to. We then have another category of country, places like Madagascar, Gabon, Suriname, etc., where we would expect increasing undernutrition in the context of a local collapse of the fish supply. So instead of having access to fish, people might move into more grains, more root vegetables, more vegetable source foods, and might not have access to adequate micronutrient supplies. And then we have kind of an interesting typology. We have the types of countries like Indonesia, small island developing states in the Pacific, Mexico, Brazil, the Philippines, where a local collapse of fish might move people into easily market accessible and affordable foods, spam, white rice, ramen, frozen pizzas, fast food. And so people are losing access to their traditional foods and moving more and more into these kind of more harmful or processed foods that would then lead to increasing cases of diabetes, obesity, hypertension, et cetera. This is of course, ignoring a lot of nuance and complexity and importance uh, for a variety of these things. But I just kind of want to frame these three, these three broad typologies of where these impacts might be felt. To think specifically about that second typology of undernutrition, if we overlap where there are places that are highly reliant on fish and also subject to micronutrient malnutrition, and then overlap it with the places that will be most affected by sea temperature rise and will lose access to fish catch, the places where orange and dark blue meet are the places where we would see a looming food crisis. In addition to that, thinking about the third typology, we have countries that are moving from undernutrition to overnutrition. This is felt kind of most acutely in the Pacific where nine out of the 10 most obese nations on earth are to be found. I work specifically in Kiribati where the population has almost a 50% prevalence of obesity. And so part of what we've shown is that when aquaculture can be done right, and if we can increase people's access to wild harvested, sustainably caught food, uh, aquatic foods, we can actually increase aquatic animal source food consumption. And then that leads to a correlative decrease in red meat consumption, poultry consumption, egg consumption, et cetera. And so some of the more harmful forms of kind of red meat and processed foods will actually decrease in the presence of these healthier animal source foods of aquatic foods. This will not take place in sub-Saharan Africa because the rates of consumption of animal source foods are still so low there that they almost require an increase in both in order to meet nutritious needs. And so where do we go from here in terms of thinking through how technology, innovation, and management and governance of our oceans could actually lead us into nutritious forms of new, uh, kind of nutrition-oriented aquaculture and fisheries management? 
And what I want to say is that uh, the Food and Agriculture Organization and many other uh, kind of broad organizations believe that if we can focus exclusively on aquaculture, there might be a way in which we increase the supply of aquatic foods and almost solve part of what is happening as a crisis with a decrease in wild caught fish catch. What I want to show here is that when we look at the different countries that are producing aquaculture, we again create these three typologies. And when we look at the 40 most undernourished nations on earth that are truly nutritionally vulnerable, we see that the countries in red are producing little to no aquaculture and so will likely uh, be, be least likely to benefit from the production of aquaculture. Trade isn't necessarily going to bring farmed fish species to these countries, and so they are unlikely to benefit from a nutritional standpoint. The countries in yellow are producing quite a bit of aquaculture, but it's almost entirely export oriented. So again, unless the money generated from aquaculture has a downstream effect on improving people's nutrition, these countries in yellow are also unlikely to benefit. The countries in green produce quite a bit of aquaculture and it's retained domestically. So this creates a possibility for benefit from these sorts of aquaculture systems. And yet much of this might go to mega cities or to wealthier households. And so you really need to focus on areas where the aquaculture is designed to benefit things like gender equality, nutritional support, healthcare access, et cetera. And so there are instances of places like Bangladesh and Cambodia where they have these kind of mixed rice farm, fish farm uh, production systems that are actually shown to have incredible impacts on human nutrition when aquaculture is produced like this. The other idea is to rehabilitate harmed ecosystems so that we can create robust fisheries that will then have a direct benefit on people's nutrition. And so this is a paper that we put together with a group of, uh, of researchers where we were looking at the impact of coral reef degradation, coral bleaching, et cetera, on the potential dietary pathways that could emerge. And what we see is that as these ecosystems degrade, there are really two potential pathways that could occur. In the presence of a more traditional economy and losing access to coral reefs and the fisheries on them, you might let, lead yourself down toward an undernourishing diet where you don't have access to fish, you don't have access to market-based foods, and so you might not be getting enough nutrients. You could also have that kind of third typology that I mentioned before, where a degraded ecosystem in the presence of a cash-based economy and access to market goods could lead you toward an overnourishing diet where you lose access to your traditional diet, you have a high presence of processed and other sorts of fast foods and cheaply available foods, and that could lead you toward excessive quantity and inadequate quality. But if we can rehabilitate these ecosystems to have access to these traditional food systems that are so important, particularly in areas of the Pacific, you could think of this as promoting more traditional diets, having access to seafood and other forms of aquatic foods, and really benefiting people's overall nutrition. We tried to look at this globally, of course, ignoring a lot of nuance and complexity, but to see where different countries fell with regard to their reef catch per capita, per capita, and also their import dependency on various types of foods. And you can see that Madagascar, a country where I've now been working for almost 25 years, falls into this kind of undernourishing diet where they have a very low reef catch because of excessive degradation and even from coral bleaching and other sorts of environmental destruction. And they also have a very low import dependency ratio where they're unable to uh, kind of switch from these traditional foods into cheaply available market foods. And so they kind of fall into that one pathway. Traditional diets in places like Kiribati, mixed diets in places like uh, many countries in the Caribbean, plus the Maldives, and then you see where you have environmental degradation plus this very high import dependency ratio. You have countries where they really switch into a more Western-based diet, and you can see the darker red indicating that the cases of cardiovascular disease rapidly increase in the presence of those sorts of diets. Another hopeful uh, kind of message is that we can see that the role of marine protected areas globally, and th this work is in, in preparation right now, it's submitted to a journal, but not yet published. But we can think of marine protected areas as rehabilitating fish biomass in local areas adjacent to different countries. 
And if we can rehabilitate the fisheries, we can increase robust fisheries that then can have a sustainable harvest on top of that healthy and thriving population for people to be able to harvest a certain amount of fish on a daily basis. And what that will do will kind of impose different marine protected areas in different parts of the world, increase fish catch, and people downstream will then benefit. There will be reductions in kind of micronutrient deficiencies based on an increasing access to these very healthy seafoods. And you can see here a kind of predicted number of thousands, tens of thousands, or hundreds of thousands of people who could benefit from increased supply of these different nutrients, depending on kind of what countries you're in and how much reef area you might be able to protect. And so ultimately what we're hoping to do is to create systems of nutrition oriented and sustainable aquaculture and fisheries management that would lead us to increasing fish catch to strengthen resilient food systems, which would lead to positive dietary change and ultimately land us in nutritional security. And it's kind of my hope that although we as a society and as a kind of global population need to and absolutely should move forward into more and more plant based foods and have that really be the center of our diets. We also need to recognize that animal source foods are really important in certain contexts. And that if you look at the kind of more minimal environmental impact and the highly nutritious content of aquatic foods, I really see this as a pathway toward healthy and sustainable diets. And with that, just want to thank many of my colleagues and postdocs and the rest of my team and a variety of different funders. And also a huge thank you to Smitha and the rest of the Harvard Dining Services team for inviting me today. And with that, would be happy to take any questions. Thank you so much. That was wonderful. Um, I, if I could be so bold, I'd love to kick us off by asking how you came to this particular work. Yeah, that's a great question. So for many years, as I mentioned, I'd been doing work in Madagascar and I began kind of living in remote and rural communities and seeing the extent to which they were so heavily reliant on wild foods for their nutrition. And this to me presented this conflict because I had initially gone to Madagascar with kind of conservation in my mind and thinking about ways in which we needed to protect local environments against the threat of human hunting and deforestation and a variety of other external threats. And what I found was uh, very thoughtful, intelligent, and knowledgeable local people who knew what the trade-offs were and yet had to hunt in order to put food on the table because in the context of being able to provide nutrition for their family or sacrifice this kind of abstract concept of biodiversity, all of us would logically make that same decision. And so I began to measure and empirically quantify the extent to which people relied on local terrestrial wildlife, things like lemurs and bats and tenrecs and carnivores, uh, in order to sustain themselves and their family. And I don't think that there is a kind of happy end to that story of continuing on with wild food consumption. I think that we will need to develop alternative systems of sustainable poultry husbandry or sustainable farming practices that can meet those dietary needs because those types of wildlife populations could never withstand the growing population in Madagascar. And as I thought about this in the kind of small microcosm in which I worked, I began seeing all of those headlines of how fish were disappearing around the world. And I began to think that this research pattern and this research theme was really a small story, but also parallel to a much bigger story and a bigger picture and began thinking of how uh, wild fisheries and their rapid decline around the planet is very much parallel to the small system that I was working in in Madagascar. And so I wanted to try to create an evidence base for how much people were, were currently relying on aquatic foods from a nutritional standpoint and what future climate change uh, would have an impact on in terms of people's future ability to, to adequately nourish themselves. That's fantastic. Thank you so much. Uh, we do have questions coming in from the audience. So uh, I'm going to let them have their turn. Gwen, do you want to, do you want to start those? Yeah. 
Absolutely. Okay. So the first question is a few questions wrapped into one. Okay. Um, so to help get a sense of scale, what fraction of fishing is done by small scale fishers versus commercial fishing? Kind of A. Uh, what fraction of aquatic foods are farmed versus fished? And do these characteristics of the fishing system vary greatly between the U.S. and the rest of the world? So I don't know the global statistics off the top of my head, but I will tell you that the numbers vary enormously based on your geography. And so if you think about a place like Madagascar, the percentage of small scale fisheries versus industrial fishing is going to be roughly on the scale of 80 to 90% coming from small scale fisheries and the remainder coming from industrial. Whereas if you think of a place like the US, it's going to be a very, very different uh, scenario. From farmed and wild, uh, it is a wild uh, farmed production just outpaced wild capture for the first time in 2016, I believe. And so uh, it was around 50-50 and it's now a bit higher for farmed production on a global scale. And in terms of that, it's still so important to understand the nuances of geography. So in thinking of a place like Madagascar, the proportion of consumption is again going to be maybe 90 to 95% uh, wild capture fish versus a very small fraction being farmed. And so when we think of all of this kind of innovative technology around farming practices, we need to also know that the majority of this might not be directed to the people who are most nutritionally in need. Sorry, did I miss one of the, the questions there? No, I think you, I think you got there. Yeah, thank you. Um, let's see, the next question is asking, does a warming climate have implications for a strategy to increase resilience of fishing areas based on marine protected areas other than just having more of them? Uh, for example, are certain regions more advantageous to protect for resilient fisheries given the effects of climate change on reefs and ocean currents? Yeah, that's such a fantastic question. I definitely want to meet and hang out with David at some point and, and chat more. So uh, this is a fantastic question. There's an entire body of researchers who work on what's called climate smart marine protected areas and think about this in detail because what we are protecting now is not necessarily what we will be protecting in 50 years. And so as these kind of climate envelopes change and places move from kind of the areas that they're in now to different areas, Fish will migrate, coral reefs might even migrate. Uh, a lot of what we think we're protecting now might not be there in the future. And so we need to be quite adaptable in terms of how we think about these as highly migratory resources. Uh, with that said, there are still ways of measuring environments that might be more adaptable to future climate change than others. And so in thinking about that, those would be particularly good places to think about management regimes or marine protected areas because we have already witnessed that they are quite resilient to current shocks. And so they might be then even more adaptable in the future. Uh, someone else is asking, they're curious about the impact of pollutants and toxins in municipal wastewater on aquaculture and fish quality in offshore waters. How can we avoid consuming seafood that potentially contain toxins? It's a fantastic question. Um, this is not just aquaculture. This is, of course, uh, both wild caught and uh, freshwater, marine, farmed, wild, every sort of uh, fish and seafood species has a kind of nutrient profile, but also a contaminant and toxicant profile. And we need to think about those in concert. It's one of the things that I'm working on with a colleague of mine here at Harvard named Elsie Sunderland, who focuses much of her work on biogeochemical cycles of mercury um, globally. And so we're hoping to be able to do this kind of broadly uh, in terms of mapping out areas where we think that if we harvest fish from this place, we could be maximizing nutrition and minimizing contaminants. Um, in the meantime, things to think about would be where your fish are being produced. Um, some areas are just going to have higher contaminant profiles than others. There are going to be places that have higher antibiotics use than others. So that's something particularly in kind of farm systems that might be important to think about. But every food type has some sort of environmental impact. 
And it's very difficult to optimize across everything that you want to be kind of beneficial. And so whether you want to focus on sustainable sourcing or carbon footprint or uh, ensuring that child slavery is not involved in the production of your foods or equitable and fair treatment of the labor supply, all of those things are going to be one dimension of a given food product. And you need to be thoughtful in terms of the things that you care about and how you can uh, make those selections for your own diet to try to minimize the harm that you care most about. Yeah, I guess kind of building off of that question, I'm just thinking about how, you know, shopping for seafood and preparing seafood can can feel a bit daunting sometimes. And what are the things that you might recommend someone ask when they're when they're shopping for fish yeah. or shellfish or, uh, you know, and it probably varies depending on the location too, but do you have kind of go-to or, or resources that uh, you recommend? Yeah, so the Marine Stewardship Council and Monterey Bay both have their indexes that kind of showcase sustainability. I think that it will be great to uh, use those, but also improve upon them in the future to better characterize kind of joint nutrition profiles, sustainability, contaminant profiles. So something our research group is working on right now is to try to identify ways of optimizing across all three of those and having that be very location specific. What I will also tell you is that it is massively difficult to do that given the transparency of global seafood trade. And so when I say transparency, I mean lack thereof. Uh, so very difficult to do that without knowing exactly where something is coming from. Uh, there's also a whole lot of seafood fraud where we don't even know exactly what species we're getting sometimes when we order it. So we really need to be thoughtful in terms of how we're sourcing this and grocery stores and restaurants and other things don't always make that very easy for us. So I would agree with that question that it is a challenge. It's something that a lot of us are thinking about and care about deeply. And I'm not sure there's a perfect answer out there right yet. Speaking of seafood fraud, you um, you know, the I think there was a big splash a few years ago when uh, particularly locally here in Boston, um, how, do you think exposure of that has caused any um, revolution in in our in that particular industry? I think that there are a lot of people working on this and excited to work on it. Um, I have colleagues at American University and Hopkins and others that are really thinking about this issue. Uh, there are kind of innovative techniques around kind of genetic profiles of species and or improving trade networks, like a colleague of mine at American, Jessica Gephardt, has just created a product that is the first ever globally coherent trade database for seafood so that you can actually tra trace back products at least two country steps to where they were originally sourced. And so uh, you can kind of detect where fish were caught, how they move, how they're converted into different products. And so it's a really interesting new tool and will continually be improved upon so that we can try to better figure out these sorts of things. Fascinating, thank you. Uh, another question in the Q&A asking, have there been any observed impact or research on the role of the tourism industry in local aquaculture dependent areas? That is going to be drawing a huge blank for me. I'm sorry, I don't have uh, any expertise on that topic, unfortunately. Not a worry. Um, let's see, there's another one. Uh, what are some current obstacles to improving the aquaculture industry for developed nations? Or is it uh, less expensive to catch fish from foreign fishing waters? I think that there is a huge amount of movement in the aquaculture industry to becoming better and better over time. Uh, so there are examples of companies like Vera Maris in Nebraska and Biomar in the EU, which are producing uh, incredibly nutritious, but also sustainable aqua feeds. And so one of the main problems with aquaculture farming traditionally has been that you have to actually feed it fish meal. And fish meal means that you have to harvest fish in the first place, convert that into a meal 
feed that to fish and then eat kind of these more palatable species that a Western market is used to. The problem is that 90 or so percent of that fish meal is actually food grade or prime food grade fish. And so we are at that point, we're kind of ineffectively and inefficiently converting fish meal into aquaculture products uh, and losing nutrients along the way. Even more, there might have been environmental justice or equity issues around where those forage fish were sourced, very often from the global south, and then all of the nutrients that are then drained toward the global north. And so the fact that the aquaculture industry is trying to, again, I'm generalizing across a very, very diverse industry, but in general, they're trying to move to more and more nutritious feeds, locally sourced feeds, and reducing the amount of fish meal that are actually produced uh, that need to go into creating these aquaculture products. So the more and more that that kind of fish meal ratio Within, fit, within fish feeds that go to aquaculture can be reduced, the more and more sustainable that will be, and probably the more and more equitable that will be in terms of keeping nutrients in the regions where they, where they started. You talked about innovations in aquaculture in general. I wonder if you can talk a little bit about some of the pieces of, of that that you think are most exciting and perhaps whether they have applications in other parts of our, you know, whether it's animal husbandry, you know, farming or or otherwise in our food system that you wish we were thinking about more broadly. So I realize it sounds boring, but I do think that the feed innovations are probably going to be the most impactful and are most exciting to me. I also think that uh, a lot of bivalve aquaculture, so harvesting oysters, mussels, clams, et cetera, can be a very important intervention in many areas because you are not only providing kind of a nutritious resource to local people, but you are also kind of providing an ecosystem service where that shellfish aquaculture could actually be filtering the water of contaminants and improving water quality for the broader ecosystem. So there is kind of a win-win in that sort of aquaculture dimension as well. Fascinating. I'll turn it back to the audience. Yeah, there's another question here. Ocean-based kelp and shellfish farms have been touted as a climate solution, as well as source of healthier local food. Um, to what extent is this a scalable solution in areas dependent on wild-caught fishing today? Yeah. Um, I, I just talked a bit about the, the shellfish piece of that, and I absolutely agree. I think that it's a, a really important intervention, production system, et cetera. Um, we do have to keep in mind that for many populations, shellfish might be uh, not a food that they choose to eat, whether it's something that is haram or it's something that might just not be culturally appropriate in certain contexts. Uh, the other thing that we need to keep in mind is that shellfish are on the more difficult side to ensure food safety. Uh, and so we do need to keep that in mind in some of the uh, kind of other areas of the world that might not have access to proper refrigeration, proper storage, proper supply chains uh, to ensure that these are safe uh, for consumption upon arrival. For the other piece, which was, I, I think you said about kelp and, and seaweeds, I see this as a very, very fruitful avenue for future kind of production and, and integration into a sustainable food system. However, I always get a lot of questions about whether or not I see that as a substitute for animal aquatic source foods. And I really don't think that that's the case. I don't think that we are at a point right now where kind of a portion of kelp or seaweed or nori, et cetera, is going to replace someone's desire to have fish or clams or whatever that might be. I do think that uh, the vast majority of seaweed production globally right now is funneled into the makeup industry or into a variety of other fillers that serve a different commercial purpose. And to whatever extent we could use this incredibly nutritious food, and integrate that into the food system, whether it's creating powders or sauces or uh, kind of innovative plant-based meats or other things, 
I think that that really could be um, part of a broader food system solution. So in the fall, we asked our students um, about some of the topics that interest them related to the food system and, and had a few questions come forward uh, about seafood. And, and this one is maybe a peripheral, but I'm fascinated. There are so many popular meat alternatives on the industry in the industry today. And we know that some are beginning to come forward that are sea alternative seafood options. I wonder if you can share your thoughts about that. I, again, think it's a really promising pathway if done right. I don't know if this will be an immediate solution in the places where I tend to focus my research most in the global south. So I don't I don't think that kind of beyond burger is going to be taking up a market share in Madagascar uh, in the near future where we don't even have a McDonald's in the country. Um, so I think that there is going to be a lot that uh, will need to happen in different contexts in different parts of the world and that there will need to be tailored solutions for each sort of food system dysfunction. Um, but I certainly think that there are large parts of our globe that really do need this sort of innovation. Um, I recently had a, a kelp burger and loved it. So I, I, I'm a I'm a believer in some of those things, but I also think that we can't assume that this is going to be a silver bullet that will address every geography and cultural system. We really need to think about particular food systems and what might be the best solution in that setting. Right. I, it does make me wonder if by finding those alternatives, it would actually allow more of the, the aquaculture from a given area to remain in that given area. I wonder if that would help with this food security concerns. There's all sorts of important trade innovations, subsidies or subsidy reform, uh, market-based mechanisms that could enormously help a lot of these sorts of problems that I've kind of identified in this presentation. So these are not just kind of ecologically based solutions. We need a variety of different types of intervention in order to, to make the food system right. Fascinating. Gwen, your turn. <laughs> yeah, as someone that works with students at the college quite a bit and, and knows how much they think about sustainability and climate. And I think food is such a great way to think about these really big topics in a tangible way. What are some ways that, you know, students who might be interested in, in this part of the food system, what are some ways that they can get involved or move the needle, just some action items that students might be able to take in this area? You no, know, that's a great question. I think that there's all sorts of different, uh, research teams that are working on really neat innovations within this space. And so kind of local organizations like the Environmental Defense Fund's kind of Boston office is doing all sorts of really neat things with uh, aquatic food systems in the broader global food system space. There are tech companies. There's a one called Biofain, F-E-Y-N, here in uh, Boston that is using kind of all of that nanoparticle innovation and technology to develop aqua feeds and other things. There, there's so many different sectors that could be involved in the aquatic food space. Um, and even now there's kind of an, an entire need for legal experts to get involved in some of the ways that we're thinking about these conflicts between industrial fishing and small scale fishers in different regions of the world. So th there are so many ways that students could insert themselves. I'd, I'd love to chat with them kind of depending on what their interests are. Uh, we have a really neat project that is up and running in Madagascar where we got funding from the National Science Foundation to create artificial coral reefs and develop those as a food security intervention. So not only to think about ways in which this will rehabilitate biodiversity, strengthen healthy, robust fisheries, but then also to measure the impact that this will have on people's livelihoods and also on their food security and nutrition in the context of an ongoing famine in the southern part of the country. And so just trying to think broadly of ways in which you could think about aquatic food systems and make sure that those narratives are not being lost in this broader global food system conversation.
terrific. Well, thank you so much. I think that's a great note to end on. Uh, we so appreciate your time and for giving us this presentation. And thank you to everyone who joined the call this afternoon. Thank you, Smitha. And we wish everyone a wonderful end of the semester and, and rest of the week. Thank you so much, Dr. Golden. Absolutely. See you, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you. All right. See you.